Nixet. I'm Goriana from the Office of Commercialization and Innovation. And throughout your candidature, you may uh, come up with inventions and you may be innovating. So this is, I'm here to tell you about um, intellectual property and what you need to know about it in relation to your degree. So what is actually commercialization and innovation? Um, we see uh, innovation as uh, being about creating ideas not just products and services that are novel and new, but they're actually implemented successfully. So when you have an idea, we want to make sure that it turns into reality, into a product, a service, or an offering. Not only that people want, but they also need it, and they're also willing to pay for that. So that's kind of the commercialization process of an innovation and an invention in the first place. So what's intellectual property? It's a product of thought, creativity, and intellectual effort, and these are inventions, design, software, and know-hows, and they can be protected by law. And the holder of this IP actually has legal entitlement or exclusive rights in relation to the subject matter of this IP. And what that means is that these IP rights actually make it available for you to protect this knowledge and the products of this knowledge. And why do you do that? Is to stop others from unauthorized use of this IP. You would wonder why would I do that? And there are in fact lots of commercially, uh, this is commercially valuable for many reasons. One reason is that this can actually help you generate research income in the future. It can also help you, um, it's a good mechanism to actually transfer your invention to benefit the community and to transfer this to other stakeholders of the university and outside of the university. It can help you with the impact of your publications in the future and also it, it can be great for your career to have experience with IP and IP protection. Why at this university, why are we interested in intellectual property? We're actually under the national principles of IP management for publicly funded research we're legally required to exploit the results of publicly funded research for the benefits of Australia. And that's great where this approach actually facilitates uh, benefits not only for the inventors being you, but also for the institution and uh, the Australian and international community. And not to mention that the experience you gain and understanding that you gain throughout this process can be very beneficial for your future employment and for your publications and for your career. These are some types of intellectual property that can be protected. So patents, designs, trademarks, and plant breeders rights actually can be formally registered, whereas there's copyright, where there is confidential information, lots of know-how and trade secrets that are not registered but are still very important pieces of IP. So why I say this, is that, um, I'll, I'll mention that later, is that often when we uh, license IP from the university, it's often a bundle of all of these. So it's not just the patent that you have, it can be a combination of trade secrets, know-how, and a patent protection that you have in place that actually builds value of the IP that we can license and exploit. To actually get a patent issued, and this is a long process, it has to be novel, non-obvious, and useful. And an invention can be um, something completely new that no one has ever come up with. It can be also a small component of something that already exists that adds value to it. And it can also be a um, different combination of known things that no one has come up with before that is useful and non-obvious. Now, to comment on the non-obvious, uh, you will be experts in your field, you will know that. And something new that you do, you will probably think, oh, anyone else could have come up with this. It's, it's really obvious to me. But I think you need to think about any new ideas, anything that you create and come up with. Think about whether, are you really sure that someone else in your field wouldn't really find that combination obvious? If not, that's a really good sign that there may be something there for you to protect and talk to us about. Some other examples are business methods, 
various softwares, um, usually the best, the most valuable piece of IP is the patent that covers compositions of matter. So actual, for example, formulations that um, particular matters, not methods of use or description of particular methods, it's actually something that's um, well defined as a composition of matter and you can have protection over that specific item. As I said, you're experts, so think outside the box. It may not be obvious for your peers, although it may be very obvious to you, but it's because you're really experts in the field and as we said, uh, skilled in the art in this area. These are some of the examples of not formally registered um, IP. So artistic works can be protected by copyright, there's music scores, lots of know-how. So know-how is something that we can't formally protect, but it really adds value to your invention and to, your, um, to the current IP that can be protected. So it could be the way to interpret data, it could be um, details about some, some met methodology that you use that's very specific to that IP. Manuals, business methods, I mentioned that before, various names in terms of trademarks, software code. These are all specific, so I'm not going to go into detail. So when you do decide to talk to us, and I suggest that you talk to us early if you do believe there is something there, and even if you're not sure, we can help you determine if there's something there or not. Um, the typical sort of thinking that we go through is to talk about um, is there an actual need for what you're working on? What is the benefit for the community if someone, if this is commercialized? Then we would go through the assessment of patentability and also um, assess the commercial value of the IP and think about the best ways to protect this invention. Something else we need to think about as well together with you is how do you envisage this product to be commercialized? How can we develop this? And often any inventions coming out of university are very early stage, which means that you need to partner with someone with capabilities, resources, and expertise to actually commercialize this product, which could often involve a licensing process of, of the IP, which is why it's very useful for us to talk to you about do you think a particular company would be interested in this IP and why and how do you see them having enough expertise and capabilities to actually help you commercialize this product. And I have read this morning actually that it's 70% of licensing that happens with industry that actually comes from the links that researchers have with specific companies which really means that it's very important for us to work with you and brainstorm about who do you know, who approached you when you had a poster presentation and said this is interesting and why, and that's, that's really a productive way of finding partners. As I mentioned, it's not just patents that get licensed and commercialized, it's a bundle of various types of IP that, that brings the value of this um, product. With students, undergraduate students, uh, they own their IP unless they decide to assign it to the university. With staff, the IP is actually university asserts ownership of that IP. When it comes to HDR students, they're treated as staff in this case, so which means that university also asserts ownership of their IP. How does this work for everyone? Is because we pay, so we cover patenting costs, and anything, any other activities, commercialization, partnering, licensing activities that are um, associated with the process. And any commercialization income that comes back from the commercialization and licensing is split 50-50, which means half of it goes, covers and supports the research team to continue research, and half of it goes to the university to support the services that we offer. How do we do this? We try to make it simple for you. So we have a two-page form, which is called an innovation disclosure form. And you don't necessarily need to start with this. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact anyone in the office to help you out. 
if we determine that you do have an innovation and invention there that we would like to assess, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to patent something straight away. It's just for us to start thinking about this to assess the patent's ability, assess the commercial value of your invention. We um, ask you to fill out this form and let's start the process. We learn about the funding, collaborators, any um, agreements, for example, confidentiality or material transfer agreement that you have in place. So we really need to have a big picture about this. And that's when we would start the assessments and help you out throughout this whole process. I mentioned contacting the office. You complete the innovation disclosure form. Then we would have a meeting and discuss everything in detail. And uh, your innovation disclosure would go to a monthly IP meeting with lots of members there with lots of experience to actually discuss um, this IP. Uh, you may not be familiar with this. I may not want to go too much in detail. However, your research may already be subject to some, uh, some partnerships. For example, some companies sign option to license agreements with the university, which gives them time to evaluate the technology before they decide to whether to license it or not. There are some provisions as part of these agreements that say that any innovation disclosures that come to us that are subject to this specific research, we need to talk to the company and let them know about this. So we will deal with this, but if, if your research is part of any such agreements, you probably know about that, so don't worry at the moment. And this goes to the IP committee, which means on monthly, which meets on a monthly basis. In terms of publishing, In terms of publishing, I understand, of course, you need to publish, you need to write your thesis, it has to be released, and that's fine. I think the key thing here is that commercialization, licensing, partnerships, patent protection should not stop you from publishing as long as it's timed properly. So the sooner you talk to us, the better, because we can actually strategically plan all these steps so that protection can be in place before you go to offshore conference. What happens sometimes, unfortunately, is that we receive a call, someone says, I have this great idea, amazing results, and I'm presenting them at a conference next week. So what do we do with that? So in those situations, yes, if we tell you, no, we need to patent, you can't present, we're stopping you from presenting. But if we do this on time, then we can strategically plan it and there shouldn't be any problems with this process. So I suggest you talk to us the sooner the better. We're here to help you, we're a service, and we really want to help you out with this process and answer any questions that you have. But we can move fast only if you tell us. We can't read your mind or know everything about your research. So thanks. And also we have a few um, assistant programs that we can discuss with you. One of them is the IP Development Fund. Another one is called Inventor Business Development Grant, which means we can help you out financially to assist some of the partnering process if you need to visit a lab or uh, talk to them at a certain point of potential partnerships, go and visit and show them what you have. We, can, we have support for that as well. And of course, um, people in our office who have lots of networks and contacts that we can um, help facilitate some of the relationships. So please feel free to utilize that resource as well. And these are our contact details. That's me there. Anna Groszolski is the director of the office and Bell Koplok is the RIP manager. So please get in touch. I hope that's helpful.